You're good to go, Jill. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Distance Learning Section's discussion group for our post-midwinter virtual event, Assessment at a Distance in Theory and in Practice. My name is Lindsay Warden, and I am the incoming co-chair of the group. I'm joined today by our presenters, Jenna Kammer and Navadeep Connell from the University of Missouri, and Natalie Bennett from the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, who will be sharing some of their experiences with student assessment in a distance learning environment. Our session will be recorded and made available on the Distance Learning Section website in the next several weeks. If you're tweeting today's session, please use hashtag DLSAssess16. Throughout the session, please feel free to ask questions through the chat box. We'll be holding on to the questions until the end of the presentations, at which time we'll ask the presenters to respond. At this time, I'd like to thank our presenters for being here with us today. Our first presenters are coming to us from the University of Missouri. Jenna Kammer is an instructional designer for the Educational Technologies Department and liaison within the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Missouri. She provides instructional and program design expertise for the development and support of online courses and specialized educational programs. She collaborates with faculty as they design online courses and develop learning resources. As a former librarian and doctoral candidate in library science, Jenna also has a keen interest in research related to collaborative initiatives between educational technologies and library departments. Navadeep Kanal is the e-learning librarian at the University of Missouri-Columbia. He leads the library's effort to ensure that distributed students of the university and online users of the library have high quality access to library services, instruction, and workshops. He works collaboratively with librarians, instructional designers, IT, and units on campus that provide online learning so that library instructors have the tools, skills, and knowledge to provide online instruction and learning material for students and library users. So after that introduction, I'm going to hand it over to Nav. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, in that case, I'll jump right in. I'm going to be covering the micro. Oh, let me switch to our slide. Okay. So I'm going to be covering the micro and the macro levels of assessment, and Jenna will talk about the meso from the perspective of an instructional designer with a library background. So most of you have probably been doing instruction for a while, so I'm not going to uh, look too, too deeply at backward design, but just mention it briefly. So backward design helps to identify desired outcomes. Uh, it helps to design instruction learning activities with those outcomes in mind, and it helps to assess whether learning outcomes are being met. Typically, when you start to plan your session, if you are not consciously using backward design, you probably have a goal in mind. Uh, you go in saying, I'm going to do this and this. Um, you expect that after the instruction session, students will go away having learned X, Y, and Z. So my third grade teacher used to say, teaching is like slinging mud at the classroom. Some of the mud will stick on most of the students, and I still remember to this day. Well, unlike mud slinging, uh, backward design is more, I think, intentional. Um, and you can often but not always contrast it with procedural or chronological methods of teaching, which sometimes comes into the fold. Uh, and of course, it helps uh, if you share the learning outcomes in the beginning with students. Uh, that way, you know, you don't uh, surprise the students with learning. Uh, let learning not be a surprise, uh, though there is a place for that too. And I want to make a quick mention of principles of curriculum and instruction, and you, most of you may have seen this. 
where some of these topics are explored further. So formative assessment is a preferred type of assessment, I would say, of, of learning outcomes that for library and modules, um, because it's necessary due to the one-shot environment most libraries face. And as it is um, ongoing during the learning process, and it helps to realign and refocus teaching activities. We'll see some examples of formative assessment online uh, and blended environments a little later. So note the progression from session uh, alignment, uh, assignment course. It's the session outcomes. Did the students achieve uh, desired outcomes? Did students use the skills and critical thinking in assignments? Were there visible transferable skills and understanding in other assignments? So transferable skills. So I know many of you will be wondering, when are you going to give us some examples, some concrete examples? So before I move on, I want to point you to a great resource that does exactly that. The authors provide many great examples of assessment activities, tips, rubrics. When I look through there, I think there are hundreds of them in there. I, was, I, I got really excited. So let me share a few examples of the case applications to online students in a, a synchronous setting. So some options are using assessment through polling, chat, uh, breakout rooms in the LMS. Uh, um, and then I just I, I say I put in discussion boards and they are great tools uh, but for discussion, but discussion posts can also be uh, assigned as pre and post activities for informal assessment. Polling serves both as yeah, interactive tools as well as assessment tools. Polling like questions on chat and discussion in breakout rooms get students interacting, engaging. Um, polling also serves like as teaching aids as the instructor uh, as the discussion gets started. So here's an example of a setup uh, for a live course using Blackboard Collaborate, uh, which is an LMS at the University of Missouri that we use. So here I'm selecting the poll type. I selected five, five question options. And as the uh, students select their polls, I can display the answers right there um, on, the, on the whiteboard, uh, what they call the whiteboard. The benefit of doing regular polls is that you can take, you can keep track of student responses. Uh, and you also can say, oh, the class is getting this, or just one or two students are not. So you get a quick uh, poll there. Uh, you get to see whether the class is keeping up, whether you need to address any particular areas before moving on. Now here's an example of something many of you will have used in other contexts. Uh, this is Poll Everywhere. Uh, the outlay may look familiar. Here the instructor is assessing student knowledge of copyright at the beginning of the session. So with polling as an assessment tool, you, you get to figure out what the students already know um, and what you need to focus on really as your beginning. It's also a tool here to get students engaged with the content. So they're not just passive um, audience, which sometimes presentations like this can get. Uh, but I think Natalie may have some interaction pieces. So here's a screenshot or a grab of a chat um, in a synchronous interaction. Uh, this can be viewed as an informal tool. What kind of questions are participants asking? Do their comments reflect understanding? Can you assess participation and quality of comments from students? Um, comments from other participants, for example, can 
instigate or ferment thought or reinforce understanding. So in this screen grab, you see participants, uh, participant names. Uh, we made them anonymous because this was to be posted later on for online viewing by anybody. But chat can be used as a more formal assessment tool as well, and not just participation points. Who led, who followed, uh, who is not catching on. So it's a quick feedback as well. And now uh, here's an example of a module we created and are starting to use in an asynchronous course. Uh, this is an online course. So the uh, instructor said, can you prepare something for the students to use? In this case, I used Qualtrics, which is a survey tool as a testing and reporting tool. So the students have taken their pretest and they're shown the results immediately. They're shown what they got right, what they got wrong, and in the red where they got something wrong, it also shows them what the right answer is. So they don't go forward not knowing what the right answer is. And uh, the results are also automatically emailed to the librarian and the instructor, we, so we can set that up. Um, and that, uh, you know, the instructors get to see where the students stand at the beginning, giving them a baseline for the student, which helps to evaluate student learning, and the effectiveness of the modules by examining the performance of a majority of students. So it serves both purposes. So um, this one in this image, the students have gone through the content portion of the module and now they're doing a post assessment here. So you can use the post assessment to find patterns in what students are getting and what they're not. Maybe uh, that is where you need to revisit the module design when you're using it the next time. Unfortunately, for an asynchronous course, there's, you can't, there's this immediate feedback cannot be used right away to change something. Post tests are also helpful carrots or sticks for motivation, especially if you're working with a course instructor and the module they're graded. But people, when they know there, there's a test, even if there isn't a grade going into their, at the end of semester, I think you know, there's a category of people at least who like to do well, so that that's, helps as a carrot. And now we're moving beyond the micro, the individual level of assessment of the student in one assignment and in one course to the overall, overall performance of the student across courses. So that's the macro area. And when we, then we can take, take another step to see if students in a course getting library instruction do better overall compared to students not getting library instruction. Did students in a course receiving information literacy perform better than those not receiving information literacy? Um, do you survey faculty about their satisfaction about their students' performance and their use of resources in their assignments, for example? Can you get institutional data on student performance and compare across courses? Now, how about retention? Can, can you find out from this institutional data if you are impacting retention? What does the institutional data show? Now here's, here's one study from 2013 uh, that claims that there are differences between students. Here's another, and a, a project at the University of Minnesota that is making and studying the claim that library use and information liter literacy instruction students get in their first year impact their academic success and overall retention. So the University of Missouri is taking part in a study as part of the Willow Alliance to uh, look at institutional data across a number of institutions to examine that claim. I think some of you I've, I've seen in the participant list are also part of this study. And this is a long, longitudinal study to see whether there, there are significant differences in learning 
outcomes between students who took library instruction in the first year of college uh, and, the, and those that did not. So individual studies like the ones in the previous slides claim there are differences. So my point uh, is that if these studies are correct, institutional data on student outcome is a macro level assessment of the effectiveness of student learning outcomes and the success of library instruction, whether on campus or online, uh, depending on the data you examine. Uh, so I'll leave you with that and uh, we'll take questions later. Now I'll pass the mic over to Jenna, who will talk more about the meso level of assessment from a slightly different approach. Thank you. Thanks, Nav. Okay, um, my name is Jenna Kammer, and I'm an instructional designer for the University of Missouri. Um, I'd like to share what we are calling the meso level of assessment, um, which is how kind of how Nav and I are working together to improve access to library services and online courses um, at the university, and particularly in the College of Arts and Science. Okay. Oops. Okay, so I want to start by providing some background. Um, as an instructional designer, I have a dual appointment as part of the Educational Technology Department and the Academic Unit um, that I support, which is the College of Arts and Science. Um, so as an instructional designer, my job is to work closely with faculty if they design online courses or develop um, learning resources in online and blended classes. So I meet regularly um, with an instructor during the design and the development phase, and then again um, while they're teaching to provide pedagogical and technical support. Um, so for most courses, and especially courses in the humanities or the social sciences, um, the faculty member and I will reach a point where linking library services will support the learning outcomes. And so at this point, we often reach out to the librarian to find out what's available that would support the students. And so depending on the nature of the course, this can range from providing um, a link in the course to the library to providing a complete module that includes um, learning library skills. And we've also created a linked workshop module, um, that's what we call it, um, to uh, learn more about library services and on the, for online courses. Um, so I also want to quickly mention um, that the team approach has been written about by several researchers, um, and one of them is this article I cited here by Shell and Crawford, um, which looks at the instructional designer as part of the collaboration between a faculty and librarian. Okay. Um, okay. So um, in this part of the presentation, um, I'm going to describe more about the process of designing the complete module that also includes library skills. So we're calling this the meso level of, ass of assessment um, because it's based on what happens when there are interactions between the group of students and the faculty and the librarians and the instructional de designers. So everyone kind of involved um, in the process of creating these courses. Um, so in the College of Arts and Science, our team of instructional designers um, started to consciously integrate library resources into online courses um, when we received the results of a survey that we give to all of our online students. Um, so in 2013, the results indicated that um, of all the services available on campus, the students wanted more access to the library through their online courses. And so through the years, we've kind of, we've worked on improving that and um, providing more library resources in courses and um, have noticed that the desire in the survey, um, the desire for library services is going down, which we think it reflects on the fact that we've provided them in the courses. So they're getting more library services than they were before. Um, and so now they have means for other things, like they need more advising and um, things like that available to them. Okay. Okay, so, all right. So um, I'd, I'd like to show you some examples of what we do to integrate library services in an online course. Um, so in the model that I'm talking about here, we're often working with faculty before either they know to reach out to the library um, or before they realize the importance of um, having it available in their course. Um, so if this picture shows a screenshot of one of the linked workshop modules. Um, 
that we are able to copy from course to course. Um, and so it just kind of includes some very general resources. So um, a video for to online students, a link to the library website, and this course that you're looking at, um, they would have an access to the mini, um, mini course on plagiarism, and then of course the LibGuide. And so that's kind of a generic um, way to provide library resources to the students. Um, in some courses, um, we try to be more specific and design um, design library skills into the course and the assessments. So similar to the backwards design approach that Nav discussed earlier, um, we first look at the course objectives to kind of determine the need for um, integrating the library skill lessons in the course, and then we build in scaffolding, like uh, practice opportunities or small stakes assessment that gives the chance, um, students a chance to do some of the library research and practice um, and kind of play around with what they're learning from their LibGuides um, and other things like that. Then they put those skills to work um, in their final projects. So when designing a full module like this, we also have to include how the assessments will be graded. Um, and so that includes how often each part of the assignment will be graded, how many points it will have, um, what criteria will be used. And so usually creating a grading rubric is the best method of assessment um, for our courses because they will be possibly taught by other instructors in different semesters. Um, so finally, the last part of the process for de designing library skill work into a course assessment um, would be a reflection with the instructor. And so at this point, this is um, usually a coaching conversation um, between the instructional designer and the instructor and if the librarian if we can get her, him or her to come. Um, but we're talk kind of about how they feel, how the lesson went, what worked, what didn't, um, where the weaknesses were with the assignment, and then what could be done to improve it for next time. Um, and then we make changes. So before the course is offered again, um, we change what needs to be done to improve it based on those conversations. Um, Okay, and in this slide, I just wanted to break down more, a little bit more about um, the different parts that are included in a fully online module. Um, so if the end result is to be able to assess those skills of the students, then we also need um, things like an announcement to kind of introduce and prepare the students for what they're about to do, a way for them to learn the material in the module, a way for them to interact in discussion, a way for them to practice through their assignments, and then finally the assessment piece where we see how much um, they learned. And, okay, so this slide is an example of an assignment that includes library components in one of our English 1000 classes. Um, so in English 1000, um, the typical face-to-face -face course will come to the library for a live library instruction session. But for an online course, um, the instructor has chosen to guide the students through library instruction in her assignment design. So her design includes four different parts. So in the first part, they learn how to contact the library. In the second part, they learn what's available for the library that's related to this class in particular. Um, and then the third part, they um, learn how to use the library for this assignment, this particular writing assignment. Um, and then finally, um, they learn how to evaluate the information that they found. And so each of these parts has a deliverable. Um, they're fully graded on their final project, but through each of these steps, they have um, small stakes of points for completion. So that the instructor's kind of able to check in with them and give them feedback about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what they found. Okay, and so this is an example of a rubric that might evaluate a full final project um, in this English class for uh, library skills in particular. And so this is um, just a, it's a very simple rubric that um, looks at did they find the right type of information and is it um, full text and scholarly and is it on topic, things like that. So, um, okay. So, okay, I'm just going to um, 
conclude, um, and I think that there will be a chance for questions at the end, and so I'd love to hear any feedback that you have about um, how librarians and instructional designers can work together to improve um, teaching and learning of library skills um, in online classes. And I am going to pass the ball to Lindsay. She's going to introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Nav and Jenna. So our next presenter is Natalie Bennett, who joins us from the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, where she is the online services librarian. Her job is to act as the leader in online instruction initiatives, the person who keeps an eye on distance learning on campus and within the library field. She creates relationships with and content for different courses that are taught in the online environment and acts as a consultant when those courses fall into another subject specialist domain. She also oversees the library's chat reference services and teaches many face-to-face -face library instruction classes and workshops. So with that, I am going to pass the ball to Natalie. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Lindsay, for the introduction. Um, so, Jenna and Nav did a really good kind of theoretical look at assessment in the online world. Um, I'm just going to talk about uh, a little bit more of a practical way of doing that and, um, and, and essentially using discussion boards to gauge student learning, um, which for me has really provided some vital qualitative uh, assessment for me with the courses that I that I teach online. Um, so I guess to get started, let's talk a little bit about the class. Um, the the course itself is a freshman rhetoric and composition two class. Um, so this is a gen ed requirement. Um, we do catch most of our freshmen this way. Uh, we do miss the smarty pants kids who test out and transfer students who might be coming in a little bit later. Um, we also have a really strong relationship with our English department. Um, every English 1010 and 1020, so that's like the rhetoric and comp one and two um, classes, each, they all come in for a library visit. So they all get that face-to-face -face, um, library instruction. And they've actually built it, the class itself, the, the, the course outcomes have a number of different, um, different library research outcomes built right into the class. Um, so, you know, you can see, see here, right, so students will develop a focused research question and identify research strategies and understand and use several multi-subject databases, right? So the, the course itself is really built so that librarians can come in and teach those, those really specific research skills. And more recently, we've had two or three sections, depending on the semester, that have moved online. And they've moved online in an asynchronous environment. Um, my institution, UTC, we haven't pushed really hard into synchronous online instruction yet as an institution. Um, it tends to be that we are fully asynchronous. I think there's one or two programs that require synchronous classes, but otherwise not. Um, and so I thought, before I go on much further, we might take a poll. So Elois, if you wouldn't mind pushing the poll out, I was just hoping you might see, you know, how do you mostly teach your students? Uh, are you teaching mostly synchronously or asynchronously or a combination of both? Um, we do have about 100 people here listening, so I thought it might be interesting to see, um, you know, what everybody's doing. So I guess we'll, we'll wait and see if, if when these results come through. I think it takes just a, a minute. Hopefully we can all see it. But I thought it might be a good way to gauge, you know. They're still tabulating, and once they tabulate, I'll let you know, Natalie. Oh, okay. Thanks, Lois. I appreciate You're welcome. that. Um, yeah, so I think that, that this is an interesting conversation, right, that I'm not sure how many librarians have the opportunity to teach synchronously, although I know, you know, Nav and Jenna just mentioned that they do it at their institution, so I don't know. I thought it would be interesting to see. I don't know. I guess maybe, perhaps I'll move on to my next slide, and, and Lois, you just let me know. So, um, the partnership, right? 
over and over in the, you know, library research, you know, or library literature, they tell us how important it is to have great partnerships. And I would just like to reiterate it briefly that, um, you know, having this really good relationship with this professor has enabled the library instruction to just get better and better every semester. And I will say that um, my partnership with uh, the, the professor that I work with closely on this course, her name is Tiffany, it hasn't always been solid, right? We, there were, uh, we've been working together for, I think, four or five semesters now, and um, we, it, at one point, I really just thought we were not speaking the same language when it came to what we wanted out of the course for the students. I mean, everything from I would create a, um, a great video and send her the link and then come to find out like a couple weeks later that she actually drops the wrong video to the students and things like that. But but now we've got it down. Oh, I see my. I think can everyone hear me OK? Oh, OK. All right. Good. Sorry. All right. All right. Then I'll, I'll just continue. I apologize. So with all that being said, you know, I would recommend just sticking with it. You know, I had a couple of a couple of really rocky um, semesters in there with Tiffany, but I think we're, we're in a good place now. Um, I have the ability to assign classwork, and I think that that's really important. Um, I give the students a video for them to watch. Um, I also, the video that I created this semester, um, I, I kind of created new videos each semester as I go along, but the video this semester was nine minutes long, contrary to, you know, what we normally do, which is like short and sweet videos. It had an introduction um, where, you know, I talked about this is where you get help, you know, here's how you set up a research appointment should you need one. I did a conversation about the differences between popular and scholarly sources, how to tell if something is credible online, and then picking the right databases. So that was kind of the parts and pieces of my video. And then they all had to fill out a worksheet. So it was it happened during work week three of the the. Um, let's see. Oh, where are the poll? Let's see if I can see the poll results. Oh, okay. So it does look like the majority are. Um, well, I guess I guess people are mostly. I can see the poll results. I think you guys could probably see them too. Um, the majority of us are, are teaching either asynchrony, asynchronously or both. So I don't know. I just thought that would be kind of interesting. I had never used the poll feature before. So thanks, Elois. <clears throat> All right. So I also was able to give the students a worksheet this semester that was graded as part of. Um, uh, part of their participation for the class. And I'll actually, let me go ahead and push out a link to you guys if you want to take a look. I've just put it in the chat. That that was the worksheet. Um, essentially, they had to find, after they watched the video, they had to go ahead and find two sources, list out the, the, um, the you know, the publication information, so the title, the author, which database did they find it in, was it popular or scholarly, how did they know, was it credible, and the justification for the choice. So that was kind of my more formal assessment for the class. Um, but we did have the following week, so it was week three, they did the content in the worksheet, and then week four, that they had to participate in the discussion forum. And as I said, I did have the ability to grade, which was extremely useful. And every semester now, um, now that Tiffany and I have really hit, hit the ground running with this and we've got a good um, partnership, we are able to iteratively change the content and approach each semester. So it's kind of a given that we have a standing coffee date where we meet and we go over everything before the semester kicks off to make sure that we're on the same page. So the discussion board. Um, this, I, I framed it as a librarian AMA. And, um, you know, so I borrowed the term from Reddit. Most of you should be familiar with that. Essentially, it's an Ask Me Anything discussion forum where um, in Reddit, you know, it's, it's mostly notable people, right, uh, businessmen or politicians or doctors and things like that. Um, you know, they, they and people flock online and, and come and ask questions at a certain date and time. Well, the librarian AMA was, 
um, the professor first starts with an initial post describing the expectations for the discussion board. Of course, they're required, if they have a discussion forum, they're required to ask a question um, or, you know, discuss within within the, the discussion board that week and as part of their participation credits. So they all had to ask a question. And then I followed up her first post with my post, which was a really short wrap up of the content in the worksheet and then invited the questions. And then throughout the week, discussion questions came rolling in and um, I would answer them kind of in batches. Um, for those of you who work with Blackboard, um, if you create a a thread inside of Blackboard, you should be able to subscribe to that thread. And I do recommend that if you're going to do um, a discussion board, because then you can you get email notifications as people post. Um, and I found that to be really useful. And, you know, I will mention that it is this was time consuming. The questions, um, most of them were very basic kind of um, reference questions, stuff that you might see. Um, you know, in a virtual reference kind of environment. Um, but it did take me a little while to type out a nice neat paragraph with links to the appropriate places and things like that. And so um, it wasn't unmanageable. This, se this semester I had three sections. And so it was about 60 students all asking questions and responding to one another. So it was kind of a busy week for me, but it wasn't so time consuming that I couldn't you know, keep up with the rest of my my life here. I still taught face-to-face -face classes and, and managed to make that work. It just felt like a, a busy week, work week for me. And so here's what that looked like. That's Tiffany's initial post, and that's my follow-up post. So I don't know if it's too small for you to read, but essentially I, you know, write, wrote just the, the top parts of, of that video, you know, don't forget about credibility, and, and then I just open it up. Now it's time for the AMA. Um, how do you feel about credibility and evaluating sources? Is there anything about the research process that's troubling you? And what I really like about this is that, um, and, and this is an image of um, a pretty standard, you know, what it looked like inside the discussion forum, where this is actually three different students. Um, the first one is asking about, um, you know, how do I cite a source that's been cited inside a source? And then two other students pitch in and say, wow, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, I was wondering the same thing. And citations are not one of our major learning outcomes for this group. And so it was great to see to see that question come through because it's something that I could address, but that, that wouldn't have made it into the video. And then you can see my response there that, you know, Go hunt down the original source if you can, and, and and then if you can't, here's what you do, right? And so this next slide, I won't read all of the questions out, but it's a sampling of questions that I received throughout that week. And you can see that um, the students were very thoughtfully asking good questions. So I'm going to just kind of click through and let you guys read along. And every now and then I do get a funny question. Would you rather fight 100 duck-sized librarians or one librarian-sized duck? Yes, that was a real question. And this one, thanks for doing this AMA. So it makes me feel like the students understand what I'm trying to do and that they've heard of an AMA or, um, you know, I feel like, I feel like it's understandable by the students. So how do I use the questions for, for assessment? 
Well, the questions that are being asked by the students are really making me see what problems they're having, right? So um, the, the worksheet was fine. I got a lot of good assessment from that kind of more formal assessment, but I don't know what they don't know, or, you know, I'm not sure what they think they don't know. Um, and so I think that that, that was, that's been really key, right? It also makes me realize how much they're not watching my videos. Um, because I, almost all of those questions, not the citation parts, but which database to use, how do I know if a source is credible, those are really common questions in the AMA this, this semester, and those things are actually covered in my video. Um, but the, and I kind of mentioned earlier, this semester, this semester I went with one long nine minute video. In previous semesters, I found great short videos from different, <laughs> different, um, I'm sorry, I was just reading through, reading the chat on the side. Um, I, uh, I found great short videos in the past that are all under three minutes and, and really well made and well put together. And I, I actually created one myself and I go back to my YouTube analytics and the students are dipping out after 30 seconds, right? They're not watching even a three minute video. And so this semester I changed gears and I said, well, I'm going to just do this a little bit more formally. I'll make a nine minute long video where it actually started with me on camera saying, hi, I'm your librarian. I'm going to be teaching you stuff, not just for this class, but this is really your your library instruction so that you can do real research here. And I, um, you know, as you, as you move along through your, your degree, please watch the whole thing. And my Google or my analytics for that video shows that the students made it about five minutes in, which I would consider a win, right? Because rather than just getting 30 seconds of content, they're actually getting five minutes of content. So they didn't quite make it all the way through. But Anyway, in either, in either case, by reading through their questions, I can start changing the video content for the following semester. Or, um, you know, really, I've been I've been talking a lot with our web services librarian about what can we do to make more interaction happen. Also, uh, my first semester doing this, I didn't have them turn in a worksheet. Um, I just gave them the videos and then had them do the the AMA and it showed me how much they needed a worksheet to keep them on track, even though the worksheet feels a little bit like busy work because they actually have to turn in an annotated bibliography a couple weeks later. Um, so, you know, I, I, hate, I hate assigning busy work, but the, the AMA showed me how much they really needed another thing, one more worksheet to turn in to keep them more on task. And then the last thing that I use the AMA for is I actually compile all of the questions that were asked and print them out in a Word document and bring them to our curriculum planning um, committee. So we've got five or six instruction librarians that work here, um, and every year we revisit the freshman composition curriculum. And the AMA has done wonders for informing us um, of what students know they don't know. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we can't force them to watch a video at home, but having them ask, you know, a question like, but how do I know something is credible? If it's from a .org, is that credible? You know, I, I appreciate that question and the, 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 the ability, you know, as Nav said, to um, have one more chance at a little bit more instruction for them. So I think that that was it. I'm actually um, going to pass the ball. Hang on, I've got to go up to my participants here and pass the ball over to Jill. She's going to run our questions. So that's kind of all I had to say. Thanks, everybody. Natalie, thank you so much. And Nav and Jenna, or Nav and Jenna, thank you both so much for your presentations. So at this point in time, we'll be asking um, the presenters to address questions from participants. And I think I've got almost every, I think I've got uh, almost everybody's questions here. Um, I do see Nicole's question about showing contact information. So I'm going to switch over to our slideshow and show that too. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and start with a question from Michael E. And Nav, I saw that you responded to Michael, but just for the benefit of, um, of everyone here who did not see your response, 
um, let's go ahead and respond to this first question. For some or any of the classes that you do, is, is the library instruction assessment part of the class grade? Uh, hi, Michael. Yes, uh, so I was uh, responding to that online uh, on chat. Um, but uh, so particularly with the, mo uh, let me see if I'm actually broadcasting. Yes, so particularly with the module design, the instructors have the option to use the grades or the points they get, um, translate that to how, how, how much it would translate within their gradebook. Uh, there are instructors who already use uh, library instruction. They design library instruction, working with librarians to say, okay, well, we need them to be able to use um, these particular databases. We need, they're looking for reference use. They're looking for the use of, um, um, of different types of resources, uh, either primary resources or um, peer reviewed resources. So they have those rubrics. Um, I do not have a list of how many. I don't have that tally, but I, I think that's a possibility to, to look at too. Um, and if I could just add something um, as far as working in online classes um, as an instructional designer, um, if we were having a library um, module or assessment piece in the online class, then we would recommend um, making that have points because as we found in online classes, the best way to get students to complete the work and the activities is to assign points to it, even if it's a small amount. I mean, um, one point sometimes will motivate a student to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. Okay, great. Our next question uh, was for Jenna from Lorelei Sterling. Do you embed LibGuides into Blackboard automatically, or is it a, on a course-by-course -course basis? Yeah, so um, we don't do it automatically, um, but we, we look for opportunities to do it as much as we can. Um, and I'm in the College of Arts and Science, so we have um, many different types of courses, like math, um, that isn't always that doesn't always have that as part of their learning objectives and um we will always ask the instructor um or you know look at the objectives ourselves and see where it fits in best um but we do usually leave it up to the instructor to kind of make that decision of whether they feel like the students will use it and if i may jump in real quick uh, right now we are working with spring shares uh, lti for libguides so that makes it real easy to plop it into courses. It still depends on the instructor how they want to use it, but we can offer it within Blackboard. Um, so that, yeah. Okay, I think our third question uh, for Jenna is from Seth Allen. How did you distinguish your meso level assessment from micro and macro assessments? Yeah, that was a good question, Seth. Um, so um, I think the approach we were thinking um, is that the micro assessment would be more at the library level. So, you know, what's happening in the library instruction session. Um, and then when we think about meso, we're thinking about um, what happens throughout the course. So. Um, by the end of the course or by the end of the large project or that kind of thing, how um, has the library made an impact or how, where are the students at with their library skills? So um, kind of a middle ground, I guess. And then the other thing we were thinking of with MESO is that it involves a lot of um, communication, um, whereas like a library instruction session may include a survey at the end. Um, a meso approach may include interviews and observation and discussion, so kind of more um, holistic or ethnographic, I guess, is kind of how I was looking at all that. So, I don't know, does that help answer your question? And, and if I may also jump in, so I, I wrote, wrote to Seth earlier, this is like a con continuum. Uh, so between where you, where you go from micro to meso, there's still some blend, I think, and so we do, for library instruction, we have the instruction level assessment, and at the end of semester, we often uh, 
uh, query instructors using uh, 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 survey tools to say, how did you, you know, did you know these differences? What were the differences? Did, were, were they helpful? How did, so that's another start of starting to move into MESA. And then in MESA, we, you go to the course level, how did students perform? Okay, great. Um, next question is for Natalie. And this question is from me to Natalie. You mentioned that in the beginning of your communication issues with Tiffany, things weren't necessarily so great. Do you have any tips for those of us who are trying to move through something similar where we're kind of working with faculty and there are communication issues or maybe there's, um, you know, not the emphasis on the importance of what we're asking them to share with students that we would like? Yeah, I think, um, I, again, I think that my biggest suggestion would just be persistence, right? That, you know, when faced with, okay, well, you know, you didn't use my videos that I gave you, thanks. You know, the, the only thing I can do is make another coffee date with her and hope that I can talk it out more um, in, in a delicate way, you know, that I can say, or, you know, I don't know. I I still haven't really, I kind of got walked, you know, that I didn't quite handle it as well as I could have, but that, you know, through persistence and, and continual meetings, right, like one or two meetings a semester, I really managed to, to get us more in sync. So, persistence. Okay, great. Um, next question, Natalie, is also for you from Emily Woolery. Do you have any generic videos, and you may have already answered this, I'm not sure. Do you have any generic videos or guides to refer students to in addition to typing out specific responses? Yeah, I saw that question, Emily. I, I don't think I, I didn't type any responses, sorry. I'm a little lax over here. But yeah, I we have a suite of tutorials that I've created over the last um, several months. Oh, wow, it's been like a year since I started. but. Um, we have database walkthrough videos. They're called Teach Yourself. That um, so I would say a brief explanation, typing out a brief explanation, and then here's a link to a video that might help you some more. That's what I did whenever it was applicable. So. All right. Um, another question, Natalie, from Allison Fields. She says, do you find that you get inundated with student questions that aren't info lit, info lit or course related, like lots of technical questions or APA, APA kinds of questions? Yeah, um, Allison, I don't find that I get a lot of technical questions. Um, and any questions that I did get that had to do with APA were, they were kind of finicky you know, the, the citation within a citation, but that's really the only example of that that I saw. So, no, I, I got to say I wasn't seeing that. One thing I was seeing was, um, you know, if someone wanted more clarification about the assignment, I might say, I don't give you a grade. You know, you've got to ask your professor this question. You know, so there was there was a little bit of that, but otherwise no no technical questions came through, so. Okay. Um, and another for you, Natalie, from Liz Glynn. How did you respond when students asked questions that were actually addressed by the videos? <laughs> That's a good question. There were a couple times where I was just so frustrated, I walked away from my computer because I'm like, no, come on. And that was in the first 30 seconds of the video. But um, for the most part, I responded um, just as I would if somebody had chatted in without having known they were supposed to see a video, right? So I just made it a point to just respond. A couple of times I said something like, a little bit of like a passive aggressive, this was, you know, as you could see in the video, or I'll recap the video here, or something like that, but I never, I never didn't answer the question. And I thought I would do that because I knew other students were also reading my responses to their classmates' questions, and so I didn't want to, I didn't want to lay the shame on them, right? I, I tried to, to just, you know, make a point of saying this was covered in the video, but still answer the question, not force them to go watch it. I think that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, and I had a, I had a big smile on my face <laughs> when you mentioned <laughs> being passive aggressive. That was awesome. <laughs> 
Um, Plus we did. Yes. <laughs> this question I think is addressed to everyone. Um, it's from Harold Hale, and he's asking, have you ever used Twitter as part of a course communication plan? And um, and the first thing that strikes me is, Nav, when you talked about formative assessment, I could totally see this being used in that way. Um, so just curious, has anyone used Twitter? I have not used Twitter myself, no. Uh, we we are not using Twitter for uh, assignments and course, but that's a great idea. I think we we should definitely look at that. We we do use it for uh, outreach uh, and promoting um, talks and things, but not for assessment. But that's that's a great idea. Both Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, I'm looking at Betsy's uh, re reply in the in the chat area, and Betsy. Please feel free to share with everyone. I think we are all very interested in hearing um, how you're using Twitter and Facebook. So please go ahead and share whatever you're willing to share in the chat box. Um, and while you're typing, I'm going to ask another question for Natalie. This one is from Deborah Keeler, and she asks, um, when you're asked if all .org sites are credible, what is your response? My response to that one was lengthy, actually. I, um, I said, you know, that you've got to go to that About Us page and find out who they are and that, you know, that it's not so much a question of credibility, that, that it's more of a question of bias and, and what is their agenda, right? So if you're on a website called gunskill.org, are they going to be presenting an equal um, idea of statistics? Probably not. Does that mean you can't use that information? Not necessarily, right? So, so it's it, that I always put it in the the gray area and the gut feeling. Trust your gut. I, I often tell freshmen to trust their gut. If it doesn't feel credible, maybe don't use it. Um, that so that's that's what I would say to that question. Okay, great. And I see that Betsy. It looks like is not going to be able to um, let us know what, what's happening. Uh, with her institution and Twitter and Facebook, she's attending another meeting. Oh no, she is good. Oh, okay. We'll have to in invite Betsy back to speak for us about Twitter. <laughs> um, okay. So one last question, and I think this might be for Jenna. It's from Lorelai. She had asked earlier about uh, LibGuides in classes, and she asks, "Is there a library module that is included in all Blackboard courses?" And you may have already addressed this. I'm not sure, so I'm sorry if I'm um, if I'm being redundant here. Yeah, that's the um, that's the one that right at this point we kind of leave that up to the instructor and kind of and look at the course objectives, um, and that is not automatically included. Um, so yeah, I guess <laughs> I'm not sure what else to add to that one. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, we are just about out of time. So again, I want to um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and especially um, our presenters, Natalie Bennett, Jenna Kammer, and Navadeep Kanal. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, a couple of you have asked about the slides and about um, the recording, and we'll make sure that you get that next week. So uh, you'll you'll see that information next week. And I'm just typing into the chat area right now how you can provide feedback. We do have an an area on the feedback for you to provide feedback specifically to the to the presenters, and we'll make sure that they get your feedback. So please, please um, be sure to provide us with uh, some feedback. And um, thanks again for, for being here, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Any Lois, if you're here with us, you can go ahead and turn off the recording. Thank you.